The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of this servant. From now on, all generations will be called, will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are not proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be <coughs> merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. was an important feast day in the church calendar, but it's one that doesn't get, it gets little if any recognition in Protestant churches. It was the feast day of Mary the Virgin, which is why I had um, Michael read that particular passage. I, I've changed the gospel reading this Sunday, because I wanted to, to join in the celebration of her life as a woman who was chosen to bear the Son of God, Jesus. There's a lot of skepticism and misunderstanding about the person of Mary. So I thought it was important that we don't not only acknowledge her feast day, but that we try to spell out what it is that we do know about her life and her witness. Now, as soon as I mentioned that we were going to talk about Mary this day, I imagine some of you might have gotten a little uncomfortable. And I can appreciate that because I have shared that discomfort from time to time, which is exactly why I want to bring it out and talk about it today, about who Mary is was and what, what we understand about her. Now we could quickly slap you know a label on it and say well Catholics worship Mary that's why I don't like this. And what I've learned over the years is that's not exactly true. That's a great overgeneralization because Mary worship is not a part of the official Catholic doctrine. Not at all. It's easy to understand how some people might come to that conclusion if you look only at the externals. Now, you don't see it very much here in the South, but in the North, it's a very common sight to see Mary statues in people's front yards. Down here, it's usually St. Francis. But up in the North, you see a lot of Mary statues. They even have little Mary grottos and statues in their homes and everything. You might have seen someone reciting Hail Marys to a rosary. These are the kind of things that make people fearful that she is being worshiped instead of Jesus. But if you dig a little bit deeper into the subject, you might understand that it's not so much worship as it is esteem and admiration and affection. Now there are some parts of her life that they honor and um, that aren't found in scripture. They consider them to be truthful because of the tradition of the church. And, um, but we're gonna talk about some of those as well. When you consider the important role that Mary played and the high honor that was given her, it's really surprising that there's relatively little written in the Bible about her. You would think there would be much more. What we know from scripture is that she was a young woman, probably a teenager, who was betrothed to a carpenter named Joseph. She's introduced to us in Luke's gospel as a virgin, and he stresses the fact that she is a virgin. And she was visited by the archangel Gabriel, who told her that she had found favor with God, and that the Holy Spirit would come upon her, and she would conceive a son whom she was to name Jesus. He would be called the Son of the Most High, and he would reign forever over a kingdom that never ends. Now, we don't know whether this was conditional on her willingness to accept this honor, or actually it was more of a burden in some ways, but truly an honor. We don't know if it was conditional on her acceptance or whether it was a done deal, whether she liked it or not. We don't know, we're not told. But her response has always struck me as one of the most humble and faith-filled statements in all of Scripture. Mary said to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. 
May it be to me as you have said. Now, keep in mind that this was not an easy thing for her to submit to. As great an honor as it was to be chosen to be Jesus' mother, there were some very serious ramifications that went along with the job description. Remember, she was betrothed to be married, and that was a very different thing than being engaged in our day and time. A betrothal was a contractual agreement between all the parties involved, and there was a period of time in which the husband-to-be would go and prepare a home for he and his bride, while the bride prepared herself to leave her family and join her husband. So even though the marriage hadn't officially begun, they weren't living together yet, it was such a serious commitment and agreement that it took a divorce to end it. So for her to suddenly be with child when she's in this betrothal state would be to risk the humiliation and pain of that divorce and the shame that it would bring on her and upon her family. Even more seriously, it was to, be, to risk being labeled an adulteress and the consequences for that could be stoning. She could have been stoned to death as a result. So the courage and the faith that she displayed in light of all of this is a model for all of us to follow, to willingly accept God's will for our lives, despite whatever fears we might have of the consequences. Matthew's Gospel shows us how the problem was solved. Mary shared, shared the news with Joseph, which I imagine wasn't too well received, but God explained it to Joseph in a dream. He had an angel come to him and say that, yes, Mary had indeed conceived by the Holy Spirit and that he should not be afraid to take her as his wife. So he did. He went ahead and married her and took care of her throughout her pregnancy. She gave birth to Jesus in very humble accommodations. We celebrated every Christmas with a little manger scene. And the, the little family received some very unexpected early visitors. The shepherds came to see this, this Christ child that was born. They had had a host of angels appear to them to say, come and see what the Lord has done in Bethlehem. They came and found Joseph and Mary, and then they headed out as the earliest evangelist to tell everybody what they'd seen. Luke says after this visit that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And that's a phrase he's going to use again after Mary and Joseph went to the temple for the dedication of Jesus when he was still just a baby. While they were there, they met two elderly people, um, Simeon and Anna, who, told, who, who recognized that Jesus was not just this precious baby, but the actual Messiah. And, and Simeon spoke very mysteriously about a sword that would pierce Mary's heart. We're told again after this visit that Mary again treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. One biblical scholar said that it was revealed to Mary how her child would be born, and that he would be the savior of his people and the ruler of, the, of all the world and forever. So she was told the beginning and the end, but she everything in between was left open. She wasn't told about all that would happen in between. It was all a mystery. And it's very much the same for us. We're told that we can begin a life of faith by putting our faith and trust in Jesus, and we're told that the destination of that faith journey will be heaven with him. But everything in between those two things is left open open. It's a mystery that we have to live out one day at a time, trusting in God, walking faithfully with Him. And it's another example because every time we have a significant event in our life, and every time we feel the Lord's presence, or feel like we've gotten a word from Him, or guidance from Him, or healing from Him, all of those times we should treasure them in our hearts. <clears throat> Store them up like little precious keepsakes, and then from time to time, take them out and ponder them. Take the time to reflect on what the Lord has done in your life. I remember when I first became a Christian, um, someone proposed that idea to me. And, and even though I had a clue about who Jesus was until my freshman year in college, as I began to look back over my life, I could see how his hand must have been on me at all these different times. Things I, I came through that I probably shouldn't have come through, or at least not come through as easily as I did. The Lord, I feel like the Lord must have had his hand on me even then, because somebody was praying for me. The virgin birth is the main event that we know about in the life of Mary, and it's one of the pillars of the doctrine of our Christian faith. Now, there are some who say that belief in the Virgin Mary is optional for Christians. I don't believe that. I think it's vital. I strongly disagree, because... 
It's an essential belief that we find not only in the scriptures, but also in the creeds that are from the very earliest days of the church. To reject it is to deny the very nature of who Jesus is. Let me explain what I mean by that. One thing Jesus said over and over again in the Gospels is that he was sent by the Father. And this is important because if you're sent, it implies that you're sent from somewhere to somewhere else. So before he was here, he existed elsewhere. It speaks of both his eternal and his dual nature, the fact that he was divine and human. You see, babies begin their existence in their mother's womb. That's where the conception starts, in the mother's womb. That's where their existence begins. But this wasn't the case for Jesus. He is the eternal son, the second person of the Trinity, who came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made <coughs> man. We say that every week in the Nicene Creed. In some mysterious way, his eternal pre-existent self became incarnate in Mary's virgin womb. And the result was Jesus, the perfect man and the perfect God, holy God and holy man. Without the virgin birth, Jesus would be just a very special person who lived a long time ago and lived a very special life and said a lot of really important things that we need to consider. If, if, it, if what those scholars who say virgin birth is optional are true, that, that's who Jesus would be. But that's not who he's revealed himself to be, and that's certainly not what Scripture tells us about him. Think about it. Jesus accepted worship. He allowed people to bow down before him. Even angels wouldn't allow that. Often when angels would appear to people, those they appeared to would bow down to worship, and they're like, no, no, don't worship us. We're just angels. But Jesus didn't stop them. He allowed them to worship him. He also said he had the power to forgive sins, which only God has the power to forgive sins. It was a very bold statement for somebody who was just a special person. And last of all, the crowning proof that we have that Jesus is who he says he is, is the resurrection, the historical evidence of the resurrection itself. Now, the next, the next big event that we have in the life of Mary that we read about in the scriptures is at a wedding. He and Jesus and the, she and Jesus and the disciples are guests at a wedding in Cana, and the, um, the family has run out of wine, which is a little embarrassing. And so they come to Mary and explain to her what has happened, and Mary says something to Jesus about it, and he said, my time has not yet come. He seems a little reluctant to act on this, this that's going to be his very first miracle. So Mary then turns to the servant and says, do whatever he tells you to do. The servant does, gets the water as Jesus instructs him, and then they have more than enough wine of the finest variety for the rest of the wedding. Another commentator pointed out that all the words of Mary that are recorded in the scriptures are directed at the angel Gabriel, just a couple to Joseph, a couple to the servant, and to Jesus himself. But this time, when she's speaking to the servant, her words are really more to, to us. They're, they're equally as important to us. It's words that each of us should heed about her son, Jesus. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. That was the message of her whole life. There's only a few other places that Mary appears in the scriptures, but the most poignant one of all is at the foot of the cross. I cannot imagine the pain that she must have felt at this moment. With all the pieces of the puzzle that she had, that she'd been given piece by piece, I don't know that she could have ever expected it would have ended this way. And yet, as Jesus hung there on the cross, even then, he showed us his servant's heart as he asked one of his disciples to take care of her. These are the things that we as Protestants acknowledge about Mary, the mother of Jesus, because these are the things that the scriptures speak to. We can point them out in the Bible. Now, the Catholic and the Orthodox faith have ascribed more to her life based on tradition and on some of the writings in the Apocrypha, which we don't acknowledge as part of the, of the Bible. And these are said to be um, reasons to honor her beyond what we've just stated, her virgin birth of Jesus and the fact that she was faithful to him and taught us what it looks like to be a disciple. 
The best known of one of these extra honors that has been placed upon Mary is the fact that they believe she was conceived without sin. That's what is meant by the Immaculate Conception. The virgin birth and the Immaculate Conception are not the same thing. Two totally different things. Virgin birth has to do with Jesus. Immaculate Conception has to do with Mary. They believe that she was conceived without sin, and they also believe that she remained a virgin the rest of her life. You may have heard her referred to as the ever-virgin Mary. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us about Mary's origins other than where she lived. We don't hear about her conception and her birth. And in a few places in Scriptures, we hear about Jesus' brothers. Catholics would say that the word used there for brothers means, means cousins or other family members. Another belief that Catholics have regarding Mary has to do with her assumption into heaven. They believe that after she died, her body did not decay, but was received up into heaven where she was crowned queen of heaven. And they say that um, this, is, this is affirmed by the fact that no one has ever produced any relics of her body. There's, ne there's never been a tomb for Mary. You would think with someone at such high an honor, there would be one. And the title queen of heaven as the mother of Jesus, who is the king of kings, they feel that that would be the fitting title for her. Now, the Catholic Church is often criticized by Protestants because of these beliefs that I've just spelled out to you. But I believe that the reaction to what we might be viewing as Mariolatry, the worship of Mary, has caused us to swing the pendulum too far in the other direction. If we fear that they esteem her too high, I think we, as a result, have esteemed her not enough. She was highly favored among all women to bear in her body the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And her humble submission to God's will for her and her devotion to her son are examples that we would all do well to follow as Christians. I've come to see Mary as truly perhaps the very first disciple. Her trust in God's will for her life, her trust in God's will for the life of her son, are examples to me. She was obedient and brave, and she remained faithful to him, even to the end. In that horrible, wonderful Good Friday day, when everyone around Jesus was in danger, she, she wouldn't leave his side, even to when they laid him in the tomb. And I think the fact that so little in Scripture is said about her is actually another example of her discipleship to me. It's likely to think that she was still alive when the Gospels were being written. And who would not want to speak with her when writing such an important biography about her son's life? And I can just imagine her saying, no, don't write about me, write about him. Talk about him. I think that's how she would respond, because what we've seen based on the little we do have about her, that humility and that willingness to bring Jesus to the world, which she literally did in her body. She would continue to do throughout her life. Remember the shoe shine's answer to the minister. There was a, a young boy polishing shoes, and a minister came to him and asked, and had his shoes shine. And while he did, he noticed that the young boy had a medal of the Virgin Mary hanging on a string around his neck. He said, Sonny, why do you wear that? And the boy said, well, she's the mother of Christ. And the minister said, yeah, but she's no different than your mother. And he said, that may be true, sir, but there's a heck of a lot of difference between the sons. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do give you thanks on this day as we honor the life of your mother, Mary. Help us to live as she did, in humble submission to the will of the Father, in obedience to all that is asked of us. Give us also the grace and courage to face the difficulties that a life of faith may bring and to look with hope to the joy of a heavenly reunion with her and all the saints who have gone before us for your throat of grace. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.